Gender and sexual diversity in China, uh, mainland China, uh, for quite some time actually. Will and I first met during our fieldwork periods in Beijing uh, in the early 2000s. Um, so I'll be talking about um, sexual gender minorities from the perspective of the families who find out or are being told that their kids are either gay or lesbian or transgender or intersex or whatever it is that they uh, choose to call themselves. Um, I'll try to be pretty brief um, this afternoon, but my presentation briefly starts from the premise that China, uh, we've heard this today, it's in the midst of a noticeable transition in terms of many aspects of social life and political uh, life as well. Uh, one of which is the increasing public acceptance of homosexuality as a social category and personal identity uh, against the sort of uh, normative, more traditional approach that it's a moral deviance that needs to be treated or even eradicated or even uh, a, a legal crime that needs to be punished somehow. So there's a uh, considerable transi transition there in the understanding of what it means to desire others who are uh, same sex or same gender or be, uh, have a gender identity that is non-normative. We also see an increasing challenge to sort of the older, more traditional ideas that a child should not live as, as an LGBT person, as Will was talking about, because they should be rather conforming to and save the face or the respectability of their families and especially the parents who have given everything to the child to bring them up in the best possible way. And now it's the child's turn as an adult person to, 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 to give back by caring for elderly parents uh, and just be an upstanding, respectable person, properly gendered, uh, opposite sex, uh, romantic lives, give birth to children, and so forth. Um, and what's, what I find interesting here, and which is, I guess, why I'm here, is that the, the con concept of happiness in whatever form we choose to talk about it, kuaile, singfu, kaisin, other notions of happiness, and also well-being are often invoked to talk about these issues in relation to being LGBT. Uh, for example, uh, 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 a, a statement by uh, somebody who was part of a documentary film I'll, I'll mention in a moment uh, said, for example, that as long as my daughter is happy, as long as she's kaisin, it doesn't matter if she is a lesbian. So this is a very new kind of sentiment, at least uttered publicly in public discourse in China today, compared to just about a decade ago in the early 2000s when I started doing my first um, field work in China on these issues. It was impossible for me to find parents who would talk about these issues publicly. It was very little discourse around, or, uh, or parents themselves who were talking about um, uh, what it meant to have a child who was gay and lesbian or, or transgender. I won't talk too much about the background, but homosexuality in China, as you might know, is not illegal per se, but there's severe social stigma around it still. However, we are seeing some changes in recent years. And just this year, uh, uh, there was a report by the United Nations uh, Development, uh, uh, UNDP, De De Development P, what is the P for again? I can't remember anyway, uh, uh, on being LGBTI in China, which was the, is the biggest social survey on um, uh, LGBT uh, uh, and social attitudes in China, uh, that also documents that it's very difficult for uh, LGBT people to live openly in Chinese society. Today, only 15% approximately are open to their families. Only 5% or so are open uh, at, at work or school. Uh, still, 15% open to the family is actually very, uh, a much larger number or a larger percentage than just uh, about a decade ago. So it's, it's changing, but it's still a very low number. And also the, the, doc, uh, the, the report found that family is the place where rejection and discrimination occur most frequently, uh, where the deepest forms of rejection and abuse reside. Physical and emotional violence is still a reality especially within the family. Most respondents admit to submit to family pressures to marry and have children. It's also Will was talking about. And some LGBTI people, as you might have seen also in the media of, of, of recent times, are being forced into psychotherapy by the parents and even conversion therapy, although formally illegal in China. So that brought me to uh, being very interested in what parents themselves are talking about when they're talking about accepting uh, and advocating for the child being lesbian and gay or transgender. So um, a lot of my earlier research was on LGBT people themselves and what, you know, what they were talking about because it was impossible for me to really reach the parents. But it's very interesting in just recent years that actually 
um, uh, now we have organizations, movements, that uh, specifically for, for parents, families, friends and allies, PFLAG, China, that are actually existing to support parents, to talk about, to convert from a, a narratives of maybe abuse or stigma or shame towards a kind of a love advocacy narrative or support narrative for their child. And it's interesting, therefore, to study happiness from below in this context because it shows us, as we have talked about this afternoon, the trickiness of really defining and understanding and knowing exactly or pinpointing what happiness really is. Uh, so from an anthropological perspective, um, uh, Will was mentioning this, that it's very much to do with relationships rather than really defining the objectives of you know, becoming happy or being happy. You know, it's about money or the house or the clothes or the body or being healthy or whatever. Uh, we see a lot from these narratives about acceptance and tolerance that it's really a relational matter uh, about people-to-people -people relationships. And from that, we can also see that's really an existential question uh, that really also, and I, I think that's actually quite important. This is not about China per se. I think this, this is really kind of a basic human condition of seeking tolerance and acceptance uh, and understanding for what makes different kinds of people happy in their lives. It's a relational thing. It's also a deeply existential issue. Uh, we're asking who are we, who want we to be, and to be able to define that and in a way that makes us happy. We are dependent on relationships being useful and, and, and functioning in some sort of way. So we have an irresolvable but also product productive dynamics between, on the one hand, these structural norms, family dynamics, family expectations about gender, sexuality, class, what we should achieve in life, how we should uh, behave. But we also have these personal desires, this, you know, the new generation of LGBT people who more and more define being happy uh, by being able to come out and live freely who they are, not being constrained by tradition. So as an anthropologist, I find it very easy to, uh, interesting to, to really uh, study that kind of tension. And I don't think it's really something that we can get out of, that we can find that one solution to what is happiness, or can, you know, is it the structural norms or the personal desires that can sort of win in the end uh, in this kind of matter. It's, it's kind of the in-between kind of daily, everyday tensions from the bottom, uh, so the ground up uh, societal level that is interesting for me uh, to study. And another point I just want to mention before I go into the specific narratives is that to study narratives, whether they're online discourses, memes, um, uh, social, uh, social media platforms, discourses, we can see kind of two ways of approaching them, I think. One, of course, is the descriptive one. You know, what are they saying? What is the content? You know, what is it about? But it's also, I think, a deeply moral and ethical question because they're saying something about what we want us, ourselves to be, my identity to be, my future to be, our relationships to be, but also society to be. So I think that whilst we're talking about happiness as some sort of um, aspiration for ourselves, it's also a deeply uh, moral and ethical issue that, of course, is to do with traditions, it's to, it's to do with structural norms that already are there, that we must deal with in some kind of way and, and somehow resolve. Um, uh, but they're, they're not necessarily something we can get out of. So they're prescriptive as well as uh, descriptive at the same time. Um, so to get back a little bit to PFLAG, um, it's a very um, new concept and movement in China per se. It comes from originally the United States of America, where it's been uh, an organization since the 1970s. Uh, it came to China in 2008, and it's since grown very, very much. Uh, it has... Um, groups in about, I think, 20 different uh, cities in China. So it is directed at and, uh, and organized by parents, friends, families, and allies of uh, individuals who are themselves lesbian, gay, uh, bisexual, transgender. And the purpose is to educate these parents, friends, families, allies of them about homosexuality, transgenderism not being a moral deviance, illness that must be eradicated, it's not a crime, it's not a bad thing if your daughter or son is gay or lesbian or whatever, it's a good thing and it's something to be proud of. So it's kind of an educational outreach foundation that teaches parents, families, friends, etc., but also the wider society to not fear and not stigmatize 
gender sexual diversity and, and minorities in, in Chinese society. And they're doing a lot of work. They're all, everywhere on social media. They have a great bilingual uh, website. This is uh, one of it, one of them. Um, or the, the, the website, um, the, the homepage in, in English. They have conferences every year where they gather fam families and friends, parents from all over China. Uh, uh, psychological counseling for families, etc. Uh, and also, um, they, they uh, speak out in the general public. If you've seen Fan Po Po's Mama Rainbow documentary film, you will see that there's a woman there whose name is Mama Wu, or Wu Mama, Mother Wu, who has been everywhere in Chinese media, in the Chinese version of Elle, um, uh, in the national newspapers, etc., talking about her son being a gay man and how she came to terms with that and that it was nothing to be sh ashamed of. Uh, so they are really an organization that has uh, had enormous influence uh, in, in recent years. And I became very interested in studying uh, their narratives through two of um, Fan Po Po's uh, recent documentary films. Uh, uh, so Fan Po Po is a famous Chinese activist and also um, a film director, openly queer, and he is... Um, uh, has done these two films in, uh, that have been co-produced by PFLAG amongst other organizations. So Mama Rainbow came out in 2012. Uh, not surprisingly, perhaps, it's about the mothers of gay, lesbian, and trans kids in China. Uh, and the other one, Pink Dads, it's really, this is really the, the shorter version of Papa Rainbow that just came now. So uh, Pink Dads came out early this year, and I think uh, Papa Rainbow is just out in its full format. Uh, and it, that one deals with the fathers of gay and lesbian uh, kids in China from the particular perspective of um, uh, China being very, uh, in many ways, a very patriarchal society uh, and how, is, how do fathers, men, middle-aged men, older men, deal with a son or daughter not fulfilling uh, gender sexual expectations. Um, and so I found this a really great resource for understanding and, and, and analyzing these narratives uh, by these parents uh, in terms of these emergence of sort of love advocacy and support narratives for a gay or lesbian child. And really showing the struggling that they're experiencing with coming to terms with this, 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 th this thing. So I'm just going to give you a few, of, uh, a few narrative clips from the films. I wish I could show them to you. Uh, but you can find them online if you Google Fan Po Po and Mama Rainbow or Pink Dads. They're actually on YouTube. And, and if not, you can email me and I will, I will find them for you. Um, so this is uh, one of the narratives from Pink Dads, um, uh, which is an interesting film, documentary film, also from the perspective of the sort of drama, uh, uh, drama workshops we've been doing today because a lot of the activist work that is filmed in that documentary film is based on um, um, staged sort of dramas written by uh, participants in workshops. So parents come together to enact these kind of scenarios where you know a son is coming out. They all play the different roles in 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 these setups. So this is not actual. Um, narrative per se, this is a sort of dramatized scenario of what probably participants in these workshops themselves uh, experience. So this is kind of an ex example of the more kind of traditional, oh God, <laughs> uh, situations where parents have a hard time. So I won't read this um, uh, all out, but uh, basically it's between the mother and the son. Mom says, you look happy, where have you been? You want to see a movie? And then they have some bantering, and then the son says, oh, you just want me to get married. And the mom says, of course I do. Can't, can you handle that? We're old. We want family happiness. You know, tian lun zhi le. Why do you think we work so hard? It's not too much to ask for grandchildren. And he says, but it's my life. I have my own ideas. Bullshit. This is China. It's not some foreign country where you can do what you like. Fine, I'll bring you back a daughter-in-law, et cetera, et cetera. So you see here, this is kind of the traditional narrative around uh, acceptance or non-acceptance of a, of a gay child. Uh, and this is a very interesting, different uh, uh, narrative by Mother Mei, Mei Yi in Mama Rainbow, who has a lesbian daughter, who has really come to terms with her daughter being a lesbian in one way or another. Um, she says she has a very sort of thought out, very well articulated um, uh, narrative about, about you know, why she accepts her daughter being a lesbian. She says all experiences they have during their 
the growing up, pr pr uh, growing up process deserve respect, regardless of the sexual orientation. These experiences should be respected, cherished, and protected. But it's not entirely unconditional, because she says, as a parent, I have several principles. Are you happy? And then, can you handle your responsibilities? When you're together with your partner, can you contribute to society? All these conditions must, must be met. It's not right. So it comes some sort of moral, ethical issues in. It's not right to be together just to resist social pressure and subsist. So it's not, you know, it's not just, just about fighting for your rights and just be like confrontational like you know, in the West. It's not okay to be depressed. Yes, you should be happy. Uh, it's not right that you don't realize the things you want to realize. You know, you must fulfill your dreams and, and, and ambitions. That's a negative life and you, don't, you really don't want it, that. So you see the, the conditional love advocacy narratives here that, and it's very come together in a, in a way that's clearly, I wouldn't say scripted, but clearly um, um, come as a result of uh, long discussions and, and probably some um, educational uh, uh, experiences. Um, and Mama Zhao, I won't read all of this, but this is someone who still struggles, and this really shows that happiness is not a very easy sort of uh, linear route from not knowing or understanding or, or stigmatizing a child to completely loving and, and accepting them, uh, because she is struggling uh, very much with dealing with this in everyday life, vis-a-vis -vis her social environments and the kind of structural constraints and norms that sh her generation and she as a mother is dealing with. Uh, you know, she says, do you think I can tell others that my child is gay? People always ask me why my kid is still single. Then I say, who knows, he's just single. Then they tell me that he's too picky. And then I don't know what else to say. In my heart, I feel pain, but I, I can't tell others the truth. And she's actually crying in this clip, and it's, it's very emotional. If I would tell them, they wouldn't understand. So happiness, again, is a relational issue. It's not a singular experience about identity politics per se. It's something that really stretches a, around uh, across um, generations. I will stop here. Uh, just uh, remind you about sort of the descriptive, prescriptive aspects of narratives of support, that there's a kind of underlying moral, ethical aspect here that is about sort of um, process uh, through time. Um, uh, we see happiness as a core family value, but we also see that what they actually mean really are changing and uh, also being contested very much. And I also think it has a transformative impact or this possibility of transformative impact on two levels. Uh, first of all, greater tolerance in general society could mean uh, a push towards policy changes in the end. So it actually could reach up to you know, the state level, the governance level, through the sort of more general public outreach. Second has to do with, uh, I think, research. Uh, you know, us as those of us in the room who are academics, um, oftentimes when we study gender sexual diversity, we do so from the perspective of those who are themselves identifying as uh, such. But it's actually quite interesting to kind of um, turn the table around a bit and look at heterosexuality or the sort of heterosexuals as a sort of problematic that we need to really analyze and look more closely at because oftentimes what we tend to do is rather to problematize again and again homosexuality or sexual difference or gender diversity. So in a way I think this is a little bit of a queer kind of analytical shift as well at least that, that, that's what I'm trying to do. So thank you and if you have questions come here. <coughs> um, I don't really know enough about this area of sexual orientation and I think it's very interesting but at the same time I think it is much easier to identify as queer in the Western context where the gay context still has a mainstream mind. Um, whereas in China you actually get the heterosexual communities are actually so oppressed. So I think kind of it, it is difficult to talk about like LGBT or especially this queer identity without being complicit with the dominant um, Mm. They, don't, uh, you know, they don't really use the term queer 
so they will say like, uh, you know, a gay or tongzhi or, or I don't think they use the term lala or lesbian, but they don't, uh, queer is not really something that is used so much, or not here and, and not other places as well, as a sort of common general term uh, in, in mainstream society. I think in China as well as a little bit over here too, it, it's kind of more of an academic and more kind of politicized term. But in terms of coming out, I think it's, an, uh, it's, it's very interesting to observe that um, critical uh, queer Asia and criti critical queer China studies as well as queer anthropology shows that outside <coughs> of the sort of ge generic West, you have a different way of approaching the coming out paradigm, namely by um, actually arguing exactly as you do, that coming out can be a negative thing in particular societies. And you know, there's different ways of letting people know that you might be not exactly what they expect you to be, so heterosexual or married or with opposite sex partner. And that kind of um, letting people know can also involve very oftentimes parents who know that my, you know, I know my son is gay, but we will never talk about it. We will just kind of, we, we agree that we'd never talk about it, we'd, but we also both, both sides will know these things. And there's a lot of ethnographic studies from around the world that shows that this is something that, that is quite predominant, probably maybe more predominant than the sort of Western generic coming out narrative in many ways, because why is it that people don't come out in different cultural contexts? Well, it's because, you know, your entire social being, your existential, you know, your, your, your sense of being a person will be eradicated if you were to do this because it simply doesn't, you know, it doesn't fit in the social context and it, it would strip you from all your social capital, your social networks, etc. So there's a lot of um, scholarship on this and um, Will and I can probably direct you to it. <laughs> Yes, so, yeah, of course, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think that um, uh, one might may work uh, in her daughter in the uh, in her try to do this kind of surgery, um, like a DC and then and Jin Jin. Um, so the neighbor, the mother, told me and said, uh, since DC is a very, um, you know, kind of what what she does is really a typical woman's turn. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, trans people are the, the, uh, mo the most marginalized within the LGBTI conundrum for sure. And even, uh, even within uh, the, the LGBT community themselves, trans people continu continually say that they feel extremely marginalized. Uh, so I, I think, you know, she's a celebrity. She's a very particular kind of person. It's like Caitlyn Jenner in, in, so in, in many ways. Loads of mainstream trans people will not be able to identify with her because they don't have her resources to be able to realize the kind of mainstream passable life as, as she's able to do. And I think that uh, certainly for trans men, you know, from f female to male, uh, f fem uh, woman to man, transgender per persons, it, it, it is definitely extremely difficult because passing is something that kind of is the, uh, is the fault line for really f feeling that you live uh, uh, that you're a good transgender person in many kinds of ways because then you're not found out and you're not ex uh, experiencing harassment. But if you don't, if you don't pass, if you're, if, if you don't pass, you are experiencing a lot of harassment. And that when you don't have a lot of understanding or prioritization from within your own community, and certainly not from public, the public that doesn't really understand trans very well at all, then it's a very, very difficult uh, situation. So I would say, 
while L and G are sort of more understood now, uh, I would say the T's in particular and, and also bisexuals have also argued that they feel very much marginalized, are still very, very, very marginalized. They're not prioritized within that LGBT kind of uh, horizon. Uh, but this is a long, long uh, discussion. <laughs>